This is a home retreat about the Gospel of Matthew. And the first question I want to ask is how did the Gospel of Matthew come to be written? Well, I picture a group of Christians coming up to Matthew and saying, you're a splendid teacher, Matthew. Mark wrote down the Gospel. He was the first to write us the Gospel, but he's a bit, a bit too concise and he leaves out plenty of the tradition. He used a book of the, Matthew used a book of the sayings of Jesus, his moral instructions and the parable stories he told. Matthew shares much of this extra material with Luke um, in a way that it possible, is possible only if the two of them had a written or memorised source which they shared. In the church, the Gospel of Matthew has always been a favourite because of his neatly balanced lessons. The children playing in the marketplace. We played the pipes to them and they wouldn't and you wouldn't dance. We had sorrowful songs and they wouldn't mourn. The balance between them. And then the delightful animal symbolisms. The fish and the snake. If a, if a child asked for a fish, would his son, um, father give him a snake? And then the division between the sheep and the goats. So there's plenty of lovely imagery, a lot in pairs and contrasts. Now Matthew must have been a Jew, writing for Jews. He proclaims right from the beginning that Jesus is the fulfilment of the Jewish hopes. And he's writing for people who find this fulfilment of Judaism in following Christ. When the John John the Baptist demurs at baptising Jesus, saying that it should be the other way round, Jesus says that they must fulfil all justice. To Matthew, it's all about fulfilment. And righteousness, or justice, is the fulfilment of the covenant which God made with Moses and the Hebrews on Sinai long ago. Jesus himself is the fulfilment, or the ideal, of the covenant which God made with Moses and the Hebrews. He's the perfection of the, of the fulfilment of the loving response to this covenant. So the whole of chapter one is devoted to the adoption of Jesus into the house of David by Joseph's naming of the child. We don't know anything about Mary's ancestry, whereas Joseph was to the house of David. And he is instructed by the angel to adopt Jesus, when Jesus himself thinks that he shouldn't mix in when she's become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is addressed as son of David only once in Mark by Bartimaeus of Jericho, but in Matthew several times. Then in the second chapter, Jesus is also shown to be a second Moses, like Moses, he looks out over the Holy Land from Mount Nebo, as did Joseph before his death. Only Moses saw the territories of the Holy Land, whereas Satan offers Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and their glory, if only Jesus would worship him. Jesus twice takes his seat on the unnamed Holy Mountain to give his new law, just like Moses on Sinai. Once for the Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Eight Beatitudes instead of the Ten Commandments, and immediately going on to quote and adjust some laws of Moses. You have heard it said, and so on, but I say to you something different. In the final scene of the Gospel, he also goes up on the high mountain in Galilee to send out his apostles to make disciples of all nations. So Matthew is a Jew writing for Christians of Jewish descent. But he doesn't therefore spare the, spare the Jews. He's fiercer than anyone in his criticism of the Jewish attitude of unthinking obedience to the law, just as the Pharisees did. Against the Jewish scribes and Pharisees, Matthew pronounces a sevenfold woe. However, the fiercest piece of irony is when Matthew depicts 
the Jewish leaders mocking Jesus on the cross, they themselves used the words of the fools mocking the just man in the biblical book of wisdom. It's an attractive idea that Matthew himself was one of the scribes. The scribes of the lawyers, the word literally means writers. You have to be literate to be a lawyer. At the end of Matthew's central sermon, chapter 13 on the parables, he says that a scribe in the kingdom of God must be a, like a householder, able to bring out from his storeroom new things as well as old which is exactly what Matthew does. He's the model of the Christian scribe. But against the, Jew the Jewish scribes and Pharisees, Matthew is unmerciful. In the course of the Gospel, 14 times, Matthew uses a formula to stress that Jesus is fulfilling the scripture. At the testing of Jesus in the desert, the rabbinical dispute between Jesus and Satan is a model of textual argument. And at the, end of the, at the end of the Gospel, the story of the death of Judas is wholly narrated in terms of biblical precedents, quotations from the Bible. Pilate, and this is only in Matthew, washes his hands in a futile Jewish gesture of trying to shift the blame. Matthew even changes the scripture to achieve the exact fulfilment of scripture. For on the cross, Jesus is offered wine mixed with gall to fulfill the psalm. Matthew's use of parables is typically Jewish too. Rabbis do a lot of teaching by means of storytelling, especially in the opposition that Matthew uses between goodies and baddies. In the seed by the sower, sown by the sower, some of it's good and some of it's bad. Houses are built on rock or sand. There are broad and narrow paths. There are the sheep and the goats to left and right. So that's typically Jewish in his method. The process of reconciling differences in the chapter on the community, chapter 18, this appears identically in the Dead, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Matthew is certainly a well-qualified teacher. From the viewpoint of the actual teaching which Matthew gives us, I think two points deserve special mention, the figure of Christ and the importance of the community. While in Mark, the gradual identity of Jesus is an unrolling mystery throughout the Gospel. It's not until Jesus has died that any human being acknowledges him in God, as Son of God. In Matthew, the identity of Jesus cannot be hidden. Already at the birth of Jesus, he is acknowledged by the cosmos, the star, and by the wisdom of the East, the Magi. They come from the land of all mysterious knowledge. And the wise men do not merely reverence the baby, they worship him. That's a word which is used properly only in the worship due to God. So it's already suggesting that Jesus is divine. From then onwards, time and again, the appellation in Mark of teacher is changed to Lord. And that's the word used to translate into Greek the sacred, unpronounceable word, the sacred, unpronounceable name of God in Hebrew. So this word in itself imparts to Jesus an air of awe and mystery. It's the mark of the disciple to address Jesus so, and it's significant that Judas, when he comes to betray Jesus, addresses Jesus as rabbi. To Judas, he is no longer Lord. At the walking on the water in Mark's account, the disciples are completely dumbfounded, whereas in Matthew they hail Jesus as Son of God. The mark and motif of the gradual discovery by the slow-witted disciples that Jesus is Messiah has disappeared. For in Matthew at Caesarea Philippi, 
Jesus is hailed not merely as Messiah, but again as Son of God. Several times, Jesus, instead of being crowded by well-wishers, is seen in an awesome confrontation with a single person. First Simon's sick mother-in-law, and next the woman with a hemorrhage on their own. It's as though they're already being brought face to face with the risen Lord himself. After the crucifixion, this homage is intensified. In Mark, the emptiness of the tomb is merely explained by a young man in celestial white garment. In Matthew, cosmic and apocalyptic signs proliferate. There are two earthquakes, the raising of the sacred dead who go into Jerusalem, and the pair of angels. Finally, on the holy mountain, the risen Christ announces that he transcends even the Son of Man in Daniel. The Son of Man, in the book of Daniel, received all authority on earth. But the risen Christ has been granted all authority in heaven and on earth. This scene provides the opportunity to move to a final point of comment, Matthew's awareness that Christ is always with his church. This is declared three times, at the beginning, middle and end of the Gospel. At the final scene on the mountain, he is building on the fullest possible authority. The risen Christ declares that he will be with his church until the end of time. The same is portended by the name Emmanuel, given at the very beginning of the Gospel. For it means, Emmanuel means God with us. Again, in the discourse on the inter interrelationships within the community, the factor which makes the community is when two or three are gathered together, there am I in the midst of them. In addition to this, or perhaps in fulfilment of it, there are subtle touches throughout the Gospel which show the same preoccupation. When Jesus forgives the paralytic sins, the crowd is not merely astonished, but glorifies God for giving such power to human beings. Not to the Son of Man only, but to humans. The power of forgiveness may be exercised by human beings in the Church. Similarly, at the feeding of the multitude, Jesus doesn't distribute the bread, but he gives it to the disciples and they distribute it. It's as though the sacraments of reconciliation and Eucharist had already been instituted. Jesus is already working through his disciples. A couple of little touches in the story of Jesus walking on the water are also significant. In Mark, Jesus has it in mind to pass them by. No, in Matthew 14, he has no such intention. And he comes not to the disciples, but to the boat itself. It's in the boat. The, 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 it's the boat that stands for the ship of the church. The point may be further reinforced in that here Peter's faith is tested and confirmed, and it's at this moment that the disciples first acknowledge Jesus as Son of God. So the stress is on the church there. A final note is that Matthew is very aware of the church and the link is both ways between Jesus and the church. In the five teaching discourses in Matthew, two are concerned mainly with the church and his disciples. Chapter 10, about how the disciples should carry out their mission. And chapter 18, about how disciples should behave to one another in community. Matthew is very clearly the gospel of the church, bent on showing how disciples of Jesus are to carry out his mission to the world. There's so much more to be said about this wonderful teaching gospel. If you're making a day of this home retreat, I suggest that you concentrate on the Sermon of the Mount. Select four moments of the day when you give it your full attention for a few minutes. 
First read the sermon right through, enjoying the imagery of the animals and the contrast between good and bad. Note how encouraging it is towards the end and what confidence it inspires. Then, for another moment of the day, concentrate on the Beatitudes. What does each of those Beatitudes mean to you? Then, at a third moment, concentrate on the six times Jesus corrects the law. You've heard it said, but I say to you. Is Jesus' teaching the same is Jesus teaching the same thing in six different ways? Or is each of them a separate way of perfecting the law? Do you fall into any of these traps? Finally, at a fourth moment, consider carefully the prayer of Jesus, the Our Father, in chapter 6, right at the middle, the centre of the Sermon on the Mount. After the invocation, Our Father in Heaven, what is the meaning of the three petitions for the glory of God and the three petitions of our own needs? And that should give you a view of Matthew's devotion to Jesus and of his instructions for the Church.